Vision on this course. Welcome to back with another episode today we have dc comedian jasmine burton how you doing today i'm doing good i'm excited to be here i am too i'm excited to have you um <laughs> thanks for reaching out i'm looking forward to the interview yeah same you know what i just noticed which is crazy because we've been talking for 30 minutes what you have a nose ring yes yes i do i used to have a nose ring i had one on this side and then i was like that's i need to get more so then i had one on each side uh-huh. and then i was going through tiktok and i saw that oh that Chris Brown had one here and one below. So then I switched to that. Okay. And then. So you have three at this point? Or? I had three. Okay. At this point. And then I took them all out just in a one fit of rage where I was like, I need to change my life. <laughs> 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 I took them all out. What happened? You, you just going through a, a stressful situation? Yeah, what? I was just stressed. I was like, I need a rebrand. Like, I'm 26. Like, I was older now. I can't have three nose rings. That's how I felt. So I took everything. I had more people. I took all of them out. I was like, I need to, yeah, except for my ears. And yeah. I Makes was sense. happy about it. I feel like 25 is when you become an adult. Yeah. So 26, you're probably like, let me be more of an adult. Yeah, exactly. Because you're like the on the other end of the 20s. You're yeah. like, I need to exactly. get my life together. 30 is coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then it's funny because once you get close to 30, then you start doing dumb shit again because you're like, I'm about to be 30 years old. What have I not done? You know what I mean? <laughs> That's accurate. Yeah, I get it. You're like, holy shit. Yeah. I just dyed my hair on my 29th birthday. I dyed my hair because I realized I had never done it before. And I was like, do I do a, a tattoo? Like, what's next? Oh, for me? man. Okay. <laughs> Those crises really hit. They really do. Okay. I want to start this show off different. Um, I, I watch Kill Tony sometimes. I like the whole one minute set thing that they do. Okay. Have you done something like that before? Um, this is tough because, you know, a lot of people, it's, I'm like a storyteller. So okay. my jokes are usually three to five minutes. Um, uh, but I'm like, I, I would love it. Let's do it. All right. Let's go. Um, I'm newly in a relationship and I'm excited about that because I think the toughest thing about being single is when you have to invent things to do when you feel sad about being single. Um, you have to invent new hobbies, other things to do. And one thing I would try was yoga solely for ulterior motives, right? I'm like, let me get flexible if I'm going to get the opportunity to sit on a dick again. You know what I mean? <laughs> I want to be ready and prepared, but it never works. The yoga instructor's like, what position do you want to do next? And my sad ass is like, what if we downward spiral? That sounds nice. <laughs> then I tried female rap, right? That was going to be my new thing. You know, when I was weak in the knees, it was going to make me want to stand up. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not letting shit slide. Not even a cha-cha, you know? But it never worked. I always left every song feeling like I disappointed the matriarchy because I could never do anything they said correctly. I turned on Megan Thee Stallion and the first thing she said was never let a broke man sex you. I was like, ooh, <laughs> Megan, I can explain. <laughs> okay. That was one minute. <laughs> it was one minute. Okay, it was one minute. Good, good. What'd you think of the joke? Um, It was all right. It was all right. <laughs> it wasn't bad. It was a nice little structure. You had a nice little, you know. It wasn't nice bad. Nice little delivery. It was, it was some structure there. But it wasn't funny. Um, I'm hard to impress. So I'm not the best. I'm not the best judge. I'm very That's hard. one of my most viral clips. Is it really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, I could it definitely I could tell when a joke isn't bad. But to make me laugh, it kind of has to be, probably got to be dark a little bit. Oh. Yeah. Okay. You got to say a little bit of something you're not supposed to say. You know, kind of stuff like that. Oh, my gosh. Um, okay. I'm like, I have a I have a dark joke. Do you really? Yeah, I'm like, let's let's run this back. Um, um, <laughs> <laughs> this is like, I haven't done this joke. This is so funny because <laughs> I haven't done this joke in a really long time. Um, but for the people that don't know, I'm actually sober. And one of the places I used to try to go to meet men was at the bar. And one time I was at a bar, a man asked me what I wanted to drink. I said, a soda, water, and lime, because that's my drink of choice because I'm sober. Um, and when I saw him going to the bar to order me a drink, I actually noticed him attempting to put something in it. Um, it was actually horrifying in the moment. I was scared. I was shaking. I didn't know what I was going to do in the situation. Um, but I think I did what any woman would have done in this situation. Um, well, any sober woman... <laughs> I drank it. Bottoms up. What? <laughs> it's not relapsing if you're roofied. That's a free lapse. And I'm taking that 10 out of 10 times. Okay. 
What about that one? <laughs> that one, I like that one better. Yeah, I like that you. Um, I like free laps. Free laps. You yeah. know, that's what my merch says. Yeah, I like that. I'm like, I feel like in front of an audience, you have the like comedic pauses. For you sure. have like the moment. And I, and you were doing that on the first one, and I thought that was funny. Could you like say something? Do you like do your own little chuckle? In yeah. The yeah, yeah. Of it? <laughs> And I was like, she acting like she really in front of a crowd. That's why I was like, I was in my bag. I was like, this is it. That just made me think about, um, I don't even know if I'll leave this in because we're just rambling. But mm -hmm. at some point um, in 2020, when there was nothing to do, me and my boys, maybe four of us came together and just did a stand-up comedy show for each other. And we told everybody about it. But the rule was, if you wanted to be here to watch it, you had to perform. So nobody wanted to perform. No they just wanted to watch. So we got down, but we stuck to the rules. So we got down to four of us who would actually go. And my first, the first guy who goes, and he was the worst. He came out and he was like, "How's everybody doing tonight? Hey, I see you in the back." And we just like, "Why is he acting like this is a thing? Just like, <laughs> just make us laugh." <laughs> and his shit was horrible because he just kept acting like it was an audience, like. And it just didn't work. Like he was like when I went, I was trying to make each person there. That uh, okay, so, so you were crowd working. Yeah. Okay, okay. But it made sense. Imagine trying to work, act like there's an audience, and these are your friends. You know what makes them laugh. Just focus on that. That's a good point. Okay, yeah. not you being like the comedic mastermind of the group. A little something. something. I yeah. love that we're starting off this interview on this strong foot of you telling me I'm not funny. No, no, you are funny. If you weren't funny, I'd tell you. I'm not. Uh, I'm pretty honest and blunt. Oh, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, pretty honest and blunt. But your jokes are good. Trust me. Thanks. I'm, I'm, I don't know how this comes off, but um, not many female comedians make me laugh. Every man says this. Yeah. It's and you know what's also funny? Being a male comedian is like an aphrodisiac. It like makes you hotter because women love funny men. Mm -hmm. Like if you even look at some of the male comedians who their wives are, you'd be freaking shocked. Like you're like, how did this man bag this girl? But women love funny men. Mm -hmm. Whereas the opposite, like a female comedian is like a boner killer. Because most of us, like, men don't find it attractive. We're, like, up there sharing too much about ourselves. Men love, like, women of mystery. Yeah. Like, Good women point. that think they're funny, not the ones that are, like, trying to steal the show. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like I was hotter before I became a comedian, if I'm being honest. But, yeah, I'm like, funny guys, you guys can, you guys got it. No, nah, that's a great perspective. That that makes sense, honestly. Yeah. Um, I, I do laugh. Some, like, I've been to Hot Bed. I know you performed there. Mm -hmm. I've been there once. And, you know, they just have different comedians coming on back to back to back. And it was this one girl, she was really trying to play into like the gay trans thing and it just wasn't working. Oh, but yeah. she, um, she had one joke about her, uh, pants and I thought it was really funny. <laughs> yeah, it was like her, she had pockets with the, with the lips, that, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. no actual pockets. So then when she turned around and showed it, she's like, what the fuck is this? That, that had me laughing pretty hard. The funny thing is I know the comedian. Okay. And I'm not going to say it on the video. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> She probably, I know that she's joke. still doing that joke though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, where's have those pants gotten then? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> those pants are all like they are like on layaway the way they be used somewhere. Right, right. Okay. Um, what's your favorite comedy moment of all time in your own personal life? Oh, like not on stage? On stage, off stage is. Um, on stage has to be, I even posted it on like Instagram. I think I get a lot of joy out of doing crowd work. Should I be looking at you or this camera? Either one. Okay. Yeah. I think I get a lot of joy out of doing crowd work because sometimes the audience says things that like I couldn't even in my best day come up with. And so I was talking to a, a couple and I was going to ask them my closing question, mm -hmm. um, which is when I ask a white people or like a white person in the audience, <laughs> a white people, <laughs> when I ask a white people, um, when I ask a white person in the audience, my closing question is when I say, fuck, Mary kill. And then I say diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I went to ask them that question. And I said, Hey, couple, can I ask you a question? She goes, we're not a couple. This is our first date. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that's insane. Like, how did you guys meet? And she goes, I fucked his roommate and he made me breakfast. And I was like, what? And I just remember in that moment knowing one that I have a viral clip on my hands. Uh -huh. That was that was like as a comedian, <laughs> yes! like they are gonna eat this up. <laughs> like I knew immediately. And sometimes you think you're like, okay, maybe this will go viral, maybe this won't. This one I was a hundred percent sure that this was gonna be a viral clip, and it did a million views on Instagram, five hundred k on TikTok. It went uh -huh. did crazy. I saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah. that's like one of my biggest ones. Um, and so I got excited one because of that, but also just two because I'm like, how often do you get a moment like this where someone says something that's out of pocket or you get a purview into someone else's life? I think like so much, I'm so hard on myself 
where I'm like, am I doing this? Am I doing this? I made this mistake. Does this make me a horrible person? Da, da, da. And then you hear the mistake someone else made and you're like, oh, I'm doing just fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like I haven't done that. So that's fucking great. When I heard it, I was like, I wonder if this is a real story. It, oh, like if it was fabricated. Oh my God. That's just so because funny. she's talking to a comedian. You're like, let's say something crazy. You she know? was so quick though. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know if it was fabricated, but you know what? It could be. But then I know me being the person I am, if I'm going to a comedy show and I'm sitting front row, I'm probably I probably prep the woman like if they mess with us, we're going to do this or something. Oh, uh, like wow. Just because I like to have fun. So I would do something like that. Oh, my God. Now you're just stealing my joy. I thought it was like the most authentic, funny moment. <laughs> it ever. might be. It might be. I'm just guessing. For my own self-esteem, I'm going to keep thinking that it was. Either way, it went viral. Yeah. And I think it was very creative how you did the. You like put on there what your thoughts were at the moment, mm-hmm. and you just doing that. I was like, damn, I might steal that. Yeah, that because good. it's just like, I think everyone also. I was like wanting the audience to know what I was thinking because I know they were probably thinking like the same thing. Mm-hmm. Especially as a black person, when white people say something that crazy, you're like, this is exactly what I think you guys do, mm-hmm. and you're actually doing it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Do you have a time when you told a joke and it didn't go over well? Um, every day. Okay. Um. <laughs> yesterday uh all the time i think like obviously you have your hits you know the stuff that you've worked on for years that you know is going to work every single time you've mm-hmm. tried it in different rooms with different races you know it's going to work every time but when you write a new joke um that's usually when something bombs or like when you think it's funny and then you realize the rest of the audience doesn't um a lot of times i'll write a joke about like shows i watch mm-hmm. like for me i watch a lot of like reality television competition shows reality television dating shows i also love like house of dragons game of thrones and to me you think oh my gosh because these shows are viral in my world other people probably watch them and so those jokes bomb all the time because half the audience hasn't seen them but you're just so committed to it because it's so funny to you you try to make them understand the show but they just don't get it because they don't know the references and it's it's terrible like you know do you watch house of dragons no i watched the first season though Okay. See, I'm like, even now, this is not a safe space for this joke, and I'm going to tell you about it. Okay. Um, There is, like... So, Game of Thrones got critiqued so much for not having black people in it. And, like, this season, when they do the remake of, like, House of Dragons now, there's black people in it, but they've, like, overcorrected. There's lesbians, there's black people, there's, like, bastards riding dragons. And, like, it's crazy. Like, they're literally seeking out children from one-parent households of the royal family <laughs> to ride dragons. <laughs> and, like, this show, you guys have overcorrected. Like, this is insane. All we wanted was black people, now we get everybody. Like, this is crazy. But the funniest part about this show is that they have a dragon that only lets black people ride it. So a white man tried to ride the dragon, he lit him on fire, he was like... <sighs> just tore his shit up then he picked he went out and picked a black rider and he was like yeah you're the only one that can ride it that rider died he went out to pick another black rider and he just only picks dreadheaded black man to let him ride and it's so funny conceptually to me yeah and i'm like if people watch the show they would think it was so funny but no one watches it but like how funny is it that there is a racist dragon yeah that, that says no whites allowed if that just show was as big as game of thrones that joke would go over very well right very well yeah i'm like what especially because like Trump had that quote about like black jobs. Yeah. And so I'm like, I read in the audience. I was like, you know what a black job is? Riding sea smoke, which is the name of the yeah. dragon. Ah, uh, yeah. Just so witty on so many levels. Yeah. <laughs> and like no you, one gets it. Yeah, you really went in. You really committed to that. <laughs> no one gets it. They see so bad. And I keep trying the joke. I'm committed to hang it, it working. Hang it up. That's what I'm saying. I gotta hang it up. Yeah. Or at least like preface the joke by saying who in here raise your hand if you've seen house of dragon season two yeah and then maybe make a joke of how about how you can't tell that joke yeah that, that's a good point that could, be the, that could be the b side of that joke maybe that has to be the framing because the way i'm going room to room bombing 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 after bomb trying to All get right. this joke to work. <laughs> Like, I'm like, audiences are sick of me. The funny thing is, is I love tricking the audience, right? Uh, I'm going to give them three of my bangers right before I go into the new shit I know is not going to work okay. in hopes that they love me. <laughs> I'm like, boom, funny, funny, funny. Now I'm going to show you who I really am. Listen to this joke. That sucks. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Honestly, that what you just said is a perfect opening for it. Like, you say your bangers, then you say that. And yeah. then go into the joke. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay. That would be a good idea. No, I mean, I'm going to do this framing. If it's it bombs, it. I'll text you. I'm good at structure. I'm, I'm pretty creative. <laughs> yeah, I'm very good. I could do anything. I've proven it to myself. I love that. Um, Okay. Last comedian I asked about this, it got a whole bunch of smoke. I don't know if you saw the Davey Ruffin situation. 
Mm-hmm. He's on live going crazy about uh, not being in somebody's top five with Andy the boss. It was pretty viral for, for a little moment. Oh, Andy. I did see that those clips with Andy. Yeah, he had, he, I asked him his top five and he didn't include Davey. Well, he kind of said, you know, no shade, Davey, but he's not in it. And Davey went off on live. So, um, but I want to know what is yours in the DMV scene? Who's your top five comedians? Um, that's so funny. Um, in the DMV scene, my top five comedians are Paris Sachet. Okay. Um, she's hilarious. I mean, she's been on Comedy Central. She has a Netflix credit. She toured with Michael Che. I mean, she is like the eight girl of okay. our scene, I feel like. Uh, and one thing I respect about her so much is how much she puts on young comedians. I feel like she's even invested in me and my career and given me spots to perform at like the DC Improv on her show or other shows that just, you know, I wouldn't have the opportunity to do if she didn't do for me. I love now, that. Yeah, she's amazing. Not only that, but she comes and does, because of her love for comedy, she comes and does shows that theoretically should be beneath her. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But she actually loves performing. She loves... Um, audiences she loves just people and so i mean she's up there for me um the second is winston hodges okay uh he is one of the funniest people i've ever met i think he the way that he writes jokes in his structure is bar none like i've never seen anyone put a joke together the way that he does or even like some people they put a good joke together but it takes multi it takes so much time i mean the first time he performs it it's already a banger and he still continues to evolve it. He has a love for the craft that I think most people don't. Um, these are like DMV local comedians, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, because I'm like, I know there's like some, there's like a lot of celebrity DMV comedians. Yeah, whatever. just local ones. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the third is Benny Nokebia. Uh, he is my co-producer of the show Young, Black, and Funny. Uh, shameless plug. Yeah, shameless plug. <laughs> I like, he is amazing. He's performed with Zaynab Johnson, Matt Reif, so many big names. Um him and I are headlining at the Comedy Store on October 17th in L.A., which is a legendary okay. club. Yeah, and you're the first to hear of that. So I'm Ooh. like, that's a... Okay. I might pull up. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, if you're ever in L.A. Yeah. on October 17th. Um, he's amazing. He's so funny. I feel like we're growing at the same time. Um, the fourth is Justo. Uh, I mean, Justo is it. Like, he is so funny. Uh, he's amazing. He is never going to stop pursuing his dream of comedy, which I respect so much. He'll try his jokes in so many different rooms, so many different audiences, travel, drive this place, drive this place, drive this place, just to test his material on everyone. Um, he's performed with Eddie Griffin, uh, Craig Robinson, uh, just literally anyone. If someone comes into town, they are probably booking Justo. Um, and then my fifth, oh my God, this is so funny. Cause I'm like, if I miss anyone, like this is gonna be terrible. Um, is Matt Deacons. Um, you know what's so funny? When you look at him, he's kind of like, he looks like he's going to be the like most trailer trash, white racist person you've ever met in your entire life. Mm-hmm. And then you find out more about him. He actually like played fo- football like at a, pretty much an HBCU. Um, and he talks about things. DC, everyone is trying to be co- politically correct. He is so not afraid to teeter that line and sometimes go past it of things that we are no longer allowed to say and somehow makes it one of the most endearing jokes I've ever hear, heard. Okay. Like you go on stage and like somehow black people are coming up afterwards and they're like, please, <laughs> where can we see you next? Like we love you. Like I literally love it. And I experience the same thing every time I watch him perform. Okay. He is like one of the best performers. And like, I'm so happy that he is who he is because the shit that he says you're not going to see it, many comedians saying it anymore because people are too afraid. Good. That sounds like my kind of guy. I want to yeah. see it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to send you his page. Because Please. I'm sold. He is like, I mean, I've just never seen anything like it. Like I literally watch him perform and you expect, like you're going to expect everyone to hate him. And somehow the entire crowd is on his side after every time. It's beautiful to watch. I love it. Sounds like, um, who does shit like that? Bill Burr. Oh my God. Sounds like his kind of style. And cause you know, Bill Burr has a black wife. Yeah. So every time I like watch him, I'm like, I love this man. And then I'll go Google his wife and I'm like, I knew it. I you can kind of tell sometimes yeah, when a when white a, guy's dating a black woman, you can kind of tell. You can totally tell. Mm-hmm. And you can also tell when a black man is dating a white woman, like in the inverse. For I'm sure. It's like, uh. it's clear. <laughs> but Bill Burr, I'm like, that is one of my goats. Yeah. He he's is nice. so funny. I like him. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a good five. Hopefully that translate well when we throw it on social media. Yeah. Um, You're from LA. 
You mentioned that in there somewhere. Born and raised. Yeah. So how did the whole Kendrick concert make you feel? It made me feel like, why am I not there to see this live? Yeah, it made me want to, like, you know, crit walk for real. That shit was tight. And you know why it was also so exciting? Because everyone across the nation was listening to this song. Mm -hmm. L.A. music rarely ever makes it out of L.A. Mm -hmm. Like, I think, like, even if you're at a club, you know, you might hear what Soak City, Big Bank, that one YG song. Like, you never really hear a lot of L.A. music out here. I mean, mm -hmm. Th Bust Down, Tatiana made it. Like, it's always just the most random one-off song yeah. that makes it. And, like, this was something that the entire world was banging, I feel like. And it really made me feel like my city is on for a minute. Like, niggas was doing our dances. Niggas was listening to our beats. They was, you know what I'm yeah. saying? I'm like, this is how <laughs> I grew up. Like, I, I was just hype. Like, I was just, I was just hype. I like, this was it. amazing. When you bump Drake now, does it still hit the same? Because, you know, this is the thing. New Drake, I never really bumped okay. anymore. But, like, old Drake, like, when he was making, like, those love songs that make you want to kill yourself, like, Sooner Than Later and Brand New mm -hmm. and stuff like that, like, I I still play those. Or How About Now? That's my favorite song to play every time before a show, which is insane. But just the lyrics about how, like, basically, like, nobody was fucking with him before he became famous. Now that he's famous, everyone wants to fuck with him. I'm like, that shit is, like, what's going to happen for me, hopefully. You know what I mean? Where I start feeling those things. Like, he's, like... I used to play my mixtape for my shorty and she would ask me to turn to Ludacris. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, how often does that probably happen for him? Yeah. It never happens. Like I'm listening to the lyrics. I'm like, this is going to be my life. Like, come on. So I'm like, old Drake, I still can do it. I still can do it. Okay. But you already wasn't on the new shit. Yeah. I already wasn't okay. on it. <clears throat> it um, for me, it didn't change, but I, cause I was kind of already on what Kendrick was talking about. Cause I hate the, the gangster shit. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I do like, supporting the new like him supporting the newer artists but i hate like leaning into the gangster shit like i want him to make music like kanye makes music yeah like, he makes he talks about his wife his family his daughter like talk about a 37 year old experience yeah yeah, yeah. You know? also kanye's new album like with ty dollar sign shout out going number one mm -hmm. but that was another album where i felt like my city was on oh, a yeah, little bit like, yeah. yeah 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 i was like very excited about that also like can we just talk about kendrick annihilated drake with that disc like, I have a joke about this, but he called Drake every name under the sun. He called him a loser, a lame, a deadbeat, a pedophile. Said he had a daughter we don't know about. And Drake's only response was, I don't have a daughter. Right. <laughs> and I was like, the other allegations are significantly more egregious. Like, why don't we address those? Yeah. Like, he called Drake a pedophile, but he also said he has pedophiles in his camp. Like, I'm like, this is, like, I wanted to know more about this. Yeah. And I saw an interview with somebody from his camp saying, um, or, or somebody saying that somebody from his camp was saying that they don't care about how the thing come out. They just hate that he was pushing that pedophile shit like it was real, like pretty much denying it and saying we hate that part. Yeah, it also is like, I mean, pedophilia is all bad. It has levels. I'm going to get killed for this if this ever gets. But like, essentially, I feel like people are saying that he's not really a pedophile because he was talking to a girl that was like 16 in the DMs. Mm -hmm. And like, I think sometimes when people think of pedophilia, they think it'd be like touching children, but it comes in so many forms. Mm -hmm. Like Drake DMing a 16 year old is out of pocket. Like there's no reason he should be talking to us. And that's like confirmed tea. Like really? there's no reason Drake is mid thirties talking to a 16 year old. Like, that's disgusting. And like, I think that some people don't view that form of pedophilia as like valid, but like, I can't imagine. Being I think they would. If that's confirmed. I think, I don't think anybody would approve of that. Okay, good. Yeah. I never heard of this. So. Yeah. That's what like it. I know Kasana like, had a situation like his photographer or some shit was doing that. Yeah. And then that, yeah. But I'm like, they gotta, cause I'm like, I think that's where it came from or maybe it's like something else. But I remember that was like news for like a good little minute. And I'm I'm glad most people think that's because I'm like ain't no way. Nah, that's all, all that shit. Wow, that music industry, in uh, industry shit be going left. Yeah, <clears throat> real bad. Okay, so you have experience going to a PWI as well as a HBCU. What's the biggest difference? Um, this is such an interesting question because. I think there are so many other benefits of going to an HBCU that I didn't know that I was going to experience until I was actually there. Like I'm from LA. I went to a predominantly white, all girls, all the, all girls, all white Catholic school. 
And at no point did I experience people making me feel less than or like I did not belong. I mean, granted, I picked up on those things just from being the only black girl. Like sometimes I felt those things internally. But at any point where my white classmates being actively racist towards me, I did not experience that. And so I come to UVA and I'm in an environment that mirrors one that I was previously in. But this time people are treating me differently. And that was a lot for me to process. And I think it's just me realizing like, okay, I'm in the South now. Things are different. It was a lot. And I, I talk about this, like I've talked about it on other podcasts before, just like a lot of people that know me know, but I was like actively called the N word by white people. And you always think of, oh, this is how I would respond if this was done to me. But I'm so emotional that I think I was just in such shock that that level of hate could exist. And like sometimes you've been called it before where, you know, white people are trying to be cute being like, ha, ah, nigga, like, you know, but this was like so targeted, so evil, so mean. Yeah. That I think I was just jarred every time it happened. I never responded. Every time. It was that It was common. so many times. Holy yeah. shit. And then it was like, it was during the time we had just got our first black president. Mm -hmm. So I feel like another aspect of that is that racism was kind of at its forefront. You know, like mm -hmm. things that you were just seeing things in the news or like in your timeline about the way people were speaking about Obama. And you're like, wait, this is like egregious. Like mm -hmm. it's so bad. And then right after that moment of extreme progress was one of our biggest setbacks, which was when Donald Trump was elected and I was in school during that election. Mm -hmm. And I remember how many people I knew and how many people that were close to me were open about the fact that they were voting for him. And that part is scary because Republicans used to be cool. You know, like they, you know, they believe what they believe. We didn't agree, but that was what it was. This was, this is different to me because I had Republican friends. This is like, you are voting for someone that is actively racist and hates me. And like his supporters are actively racist and hate me. And so for me, that is what fledged me into going to an HBCU. I was like UVA, although it was like the best experience of my life, I would never trade it towards the end. It was one of the scariest environments that I had been in. Sounds like it. Yeah. It was just, I still can't really like put into words. I mean, UVA is a liberal campus. So like you have, Half of them being the most liberal people you're ever going to meet in your life, but the other half being the exact opposite. And so I only applied to Howard for law school, which I don't recommend to anybody watching this. If you're going to apply to law school, please apply to like some safety schools, something you'll think you'll get into at least like a few. But for me, I only applied to Howard because I knew that that was the only school that I wanted to go to following, you know, my experience at UVA. I think that I knew I wanted to be around black people. That's as simple as my thought process was. I think what I didn't anticipate was how many other benefits I was going to experience. I had a perm my whole life. I went natural when I went to Howard. And it's just because you're surrounded by people that love their hair, that love themselves, have never been made to feel like they're not beautiful in any way. And so I'm like, dang, okay, maybe I am too. And so I started wearing my natural curls. Never had done that before. I used to have beautiful curls and I don't even now I'm like, why did I perm them? But that was a huge benefit. Um, I think I changed the way that I spoke. I think that in white environments, we all do this. We code switch. We change our voices. We try to make ourselves sound more acceptable and all those things. I got more comfortable in the way that I naturally speak, which I think was a huge benefit. Um, I learned about the law from people who the law was designed to disenfranchise. I think that was amazing because, you know, you can go to any school and learn about, you know, the actual law, the context of it, all those things, but you don't learn it from the people who have suffered from it or have been like inhibited from it systemically. And so, I mean, like I will sing Howard's praises from the rooftops when it comes to like law school and all of those things. Um, but I'm happy I went to an HBCU and, Again, I think there's so many benefits. I'm happy I did both. Mm -hmm. I very am really I'm happy I did both. Um, just because UVA education wise is bar none. That on a resume is amazing. But I'm so happy I got to experience an HBCU as well because I really helped think that helped me learn to love myself holistically. Okay. Oh, that's a great experience on both ends, honestly. Even the negative ones is still still a lesson in that. It's still a lesson. And like um I'm happy it's something I guess that's like a weird way to phrase it, but I am happy that it's something that I experienced because I think before I lived in like this little sheltered bubble. Exactly. And that was kind of like when real life hit me in the face and 
I think it helped me see like how the world really works, which I'm happy that I experienced, I guess, in the long term. Okay. That's good. Moving on into politics. I know oh, you're, yay! I know you're the funny girl, but you also have a very serious side. Yeah. I like to get into your political bag, I see. You know what's so funny? Everyone keeps DMing, like, they'll comment, they'll be like, can you make a joke about this? Can you make a joke about this? And I'm like, how is this funny? <laughs> like, <laughs> nah, democracy for real. is Some ending. Is. Like, this is so scary. I, I feel like that's, like, my edges on stage. Mm -hmm. I'm a lawyer. I can potentially bring perspective to these issues in a funny way. That's always what I thought I was going to be when I got into comedy. But how it's too serious mm -hmm. for me to be able to like make the joke. It's a, it's a very serious moment yeah. going on right now. And I'm, I just got into politics kind of heavy maybe like a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm actually looking at what's happening, it's kind of crazy that a lot of this is going on. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what your number one concern is, though. My number one concern is the number of black and Latino men that are considering voting for Trump in the next election. Well, 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 as far as like, um, like policy wise, which is oh. number one concern. Um, like for me, my number one concern is foreign affairs, our foreign policy. What would yours be? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I don't know if I have like a, a number one policy concern. I think mine is like if Donald Trump were to be elected, the various things that would happen in each state scares me. Okay. Um, I think, for example, like uh, if someone, when Trump was elected, he put several Supreme Court justices on the bench. Mm -hmm. Now we have to live with those justices for however many 30 20, 40 years, however long they live, because it's a lifetime appointment. Yeah. Those people will be making decisions for our country, and the Supreme Court's the law of the land. So I'm like, that is what scares me. It's like, if he were to be elected, the number of people that he can put, even not on the Supreme Court, in benches across the various states, that scares me. Like, judges making decisions that could be uh, adverse to the majority of black people's interests, that scares me probably the most. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, I think that being a, a no term on those appointments, I think that's just a crazy concept in general. It's crazy. It's uh, this is the thing. Like when when it started, America is like eons ahead of this in regards to like theory. Like the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judiciary all essentially operating together and serving as checks and balances for the other. That's so beautiful. And like our country has like avoided going into so many like economic or social perils that other countries have because that's our layout. Mm -hmm. But there are downsides. And I think one of them is the lifetime appointment of Supreme court justices. That is like insane that every other position can be up for reelection. Yeah. Um, but also I think the one benefit is it prevents people that don't have a history with the law from just being appointed by the people just because someone likes them. Like say, for example, the way we appointed Donald Trump with no political history, say if people were able to do that at the Supreme court, that'd be scary as shit. Yeah. Like yeah. if you could elect Supreme court justices, like that could be really bad. See, I, I have trouble with that because I'm such a, I'm such a fair, like in the middle person. So like, even okay. if something is like scary or like, I don't agree with it. If it's fair, I can accept it. Like that's how my okay. brain works. So even like Donald Trump not having no political history, I'm like, if 50% of the, of the country wanted that, I can take that because okay. eventually they have to feel that. Yeah. Which is why I, I didn't like, like I'm glad that the censorship shit is kind of over with. Yeah. But I would see a lot of liberal people being for that. And that's so scary to me. Like I get that you don't like what's being said right now, but public sentiment changes so so often. Like imagine that's if a good point. imagine if censorship was around in the eighties and people are saying, like, no, don't lock up black people, don't do this. It's like quiet that person, quiet that person. Yeah. And then it's just jail, jail, jail. So it will flip on you. And yeah. you got you gotta think like ten years ahead. Yeah, that's a really good point. I didn't even thought <laughs> that's another thing, it's the censorship issue. I'm like, we have so many ah! Yeah, I, that's why I'm for it. Like, I don't, I don't care if a Nazi is saying shit on Twitter. Like, let it happen because you don't know how the world's going to change, and you don't want to shut the right person up. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a good point. Like, whatever. There's two, there's two edges to the sword. Essentially, is what I hear you saying. Exactly. And I agree. Like, if you shut this person up, then you have to shut this person up as well on the opposite side. Exactly. Which is someone you agree with. Like you said, like imagine Trump wins, and then somebody's saying somebody's detailing the Supreme Court situation, and they send to them. Mm -hmm. So then it's like. That it, it'll spin on you. So. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I think um, we're seeing this a lot with um, 
like the idea of DAFs are like donor advised funds and mm-hmm. trying to prevent certain people from giving money to certain organizations that uh, filter hate and that like spew hate and all those things. Mm-hmm. But it's like, if you do that, then they could potentially fight back and say, then you could stop giving money to these people that only give money to disadvantaged communities, minorities and all of those people. So like if you stop wanting them to donate to all white people, then they're going to have to stop donating to all black people as well. So it's like, uh, exactly. there's two edges to that. Story. And I often see, cause I identify as a moderate because mm-hmm. there's, there's things on both sides that I like and dislike. And when I talk to certain liberals about certain things, it's like, sometimes it gets down to, it seems like they're less, they're more indecisive than conservatives. Mm-hmm. Like if you speak about like, I think all liberals are like, you know, do something for the poor, help out the disenfranchised, all those people. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's like allow immigrants in and like they pull from the same benefits. So it's like, you can't do both. Somebody has to take an L there. Yeah. And like conservatives would be like, get the immigrants out of here. Let's focus on the poor. So, but then they're hurt and I care about them too. I'm, I'm more so pro humanity than anything. So mm-hmm. that's some of the, some of the decisions are tough, but if you don't make them, it's just like you just do like a little bit for everything instead of like completely solving a thing. And like to your point, I think the two party system like right now is it's been the most evident that it's not the best mm-hmm. because I think so many of the Democrats and liberals right now, we're just in this boat because we can't be Republicans. Like I think so many of us identify as moderates and like want to get back to the days where we actually could have opinions where potentially you don't have to be as far left as we're required to be or all of those things. Exactly. But a lot of times just because Republicans are being racist right now, you know, the rest of us are just kind of all in this boat. We don't really agree on anything. We just yeah. can't go over there. Yeah, <laughs> so and, it, and it sucks. Like, yeah. Because the, the last guest I had yesterday, her name's Afini. Yeah. Uh, Afini X on Instagram. And she was pretty much breaking this down because she's, she's like fed up with the Democrats. Like mm-hmm. she's like, Kamala doesn't deserve our vote. She did this. They call them for a ceasefire, but they're taking money from APAC, which is the Israeli uh, lobbyist group. And um, she like really don't want to fuck with them. But she like, I'm not fucking with Trump though. But her thing is to, to vote for a third party anyway. And what I learned from her, she was like, once if a third party gets 5% of the popular popular vote, then they get um, federal match funding and the, the, they'll get more money from the government for their campaigning. Mm. So that's her strategy to just go third, even though she know they won't win, but at least it puts them in, in line for maybe eight years now. So, but it's tough. All it's a tough decision around the. Uh, no, I agree with over. her. Like, I I totally see that perspective. Like, right now we are in an extremely shit position, and I think also, what's happening with Israel and Gaza is really why Joe Biden had to step down. Like, I guess Kamala is associated with it because she was the vice president, but so many people felt uncomfortable voting for Joe Biden based on what he's done with that conflict, and I think you know we hate Donald Trump because he spewed hate and racism towards you know certain groups but joe biden based on what he's done in israel and gaza i'm not saying that he's overtly expressed hate but his actions have allowed it and so it's like it's tough to be on either side of that coin i think the third when i think about the third party idea i think again like love the idea of it positioning them in a way where you know eight down years down the line potentially now we can have another scenario but i think with this election to me it is so scary if Donald Trump is elected, like, yes, you know, Kamala has her flaws, you know, but like, it, it sucks that we have to do this. Even when we vote, we're just choosing between, you know, the lesser of two evils. Um, I love Kamala personally, so I don't even think she's the lesser of two evils. Like I, it's sick how much I support her. I, I see. Yeah. Like, yeah <laughs> I think your little post funny. He was like, I am a happy girl. It was I'm, funny. <laughs> I'm Kamala the house down. Like I really am. I'm not even going to lie to you. I'm not even going to lie. But like, I, I see why people are doing it. Mm-hmm. Like I completely see why people don't want to give their votes to either person. So. I get everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's always celebrities on both sides supporting whatever candidate they want to align with. How do you feel about celebrities being looked at as role models? And do you feel like they have a duty to be one? Um, you know what's so funny? I did you did you watch any of my content? A little something. something. I'm like, this is the first video I ever made on my YouTube channel was about this topic. Um, it depends. I think that it is unfortunate that sometimes when you pursue your goal in your dreams, it has now put you in a position where people are looking to you for answers. They're looking to you to act a certain way. They're looking to you to do a certain way. I think about that with athletes. 
all the time. Like all you wanted to do from when you were four years old was to play football or play basketball. And now you have millions of people that are following you around, expecting you to abide by a certain code, expecting you to live a certain way. That is tough. I don't think that celebrities should be required to act a certain way or to serve as role models. I do think that they should be conscious of the fact that they could be seen that way. Like, I think it depends on how you brand yourself, for example. Like, I think Cardi B is really, she's a musician. She's been outspoken about the fact that she's not a role model. But when she came into the scene, she branded herself as someone that's not a role model. She was like a stripper turned rapper. Mm -hmm. She cussed all the time. She was very much so like, I am not here to be a role model for your kids. So she should not be required to be. Like, even if, yes, kids follow her, even if, you know, as parents, you have to do your due diligence to try to shield them shield the kids from her if that's what you want and all of those things. But other people, if they brand themselves as someone in that space, um, then I think that they should be expected to not live a certain way, but be conscious of the fact that there are kids following them and not filter their material, but potentially be conscious of what they're releasing if they know that other people are going to be seeing it. But for me, it's also on, you know, it is tough for parents nowadays because I was a smart kid too. I was weaseling around the little blockades that they put. We're mm-hmm. smart kids. Kids are smart, you know? So parents can try to shield things from their kids, like give their best effort, but it does not fall fully on celebrities to be role models by any means. Okay. That's a fair answer. I also think in this political arena, the question is now, do these celebrities have, do they have to speak out about who they are voting for or request that people vote for a certain candidate? I think that's where I kind of struggle. Like they don't have to. I would I would assume both parties just understand like it, it's kind of disrespectful to black people, but mm-hmm. they understand that if you align yourself with a face that we're all comfortable with, that somebody will vote just cuz you that Quavo up or you used a a line or cuz they saw Amber Rose. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's a really good point. Everybody's for sale like Dr. Cornell West talks about that if you pay attention to him. Yeah. He's always mentioning how people are for sale. Yeah. Um, even the people who you're running for, like if you if you follow the money and look who's doing into what, it kind of tells you what they really stand for. Cash rules everything around me. You know what I mean? Cash. That's that's okay. literally it. But don't oh let God. it rule you. But don't let it rule you. They they get they get free wisdom on this fucking podcast. Nah, right no now. bullshit. We do. <laughs> <laughs> we talk it. <laughs> um, uh, two more questions. Okay. Earlier you mentioned how you really love the fact that when you went to Howard, you got to learn from people who the law was designed to go against. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about legislators or political figures who want to get rid of critical race theory in school? That's horseshit. Like I, I think that, I think that the buzzword critical race theory is deterring people from what they're actually trying to do. They're trying to, to eliminate perspective. And like that to me is scary and it's, it shouldn't be allowed. I think about so much, if you were to teach slavery in schools, it's not because you're trying to make white children feel guilty, which is what their argument is. It's because you want people to understand what America has done in its history to black people to allow them to be in the position that they are in society today. It's the perspective that really allows people to see the truth, and that's what they're trying to eliminate, and that to me should not be allowed. I think we attach like critical race theory, now we have all the buzzwords, we have them in our head, like they want... We are teaching them about black people and we're teaching them about this. And like, no, we are giving perspective to perspective to America's history so that students can understand what we have done to various groups of people. And it's not just black people. We're learning about what we did to American Indians as well. I mean, they were the gangsters here first and we just booted them. Like teaching kids that to me is necessary. And like, I think the second question to that is how early do you expose kids to that information? Because you don't also want kids to feel uncomfortable in school, like learning that they're slaves, like whatever. But I think to me that that one should be given to kids at whatever grade level it currently is. I don't know if it's like fifth, sixth. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, whatever. But I think again, like to me, it's worth learning, okay, America enslaved black people at in whatever year they were, I don't remember the 18th, whatever it was. And not telling them why, what happened, how they've progressed since. It's like the necessary context. I don't want to just hear I'm a slave. You think that's going to make me want to go to lunch and sit at the fucking tables with my classmates? Not like, yet. that's going to make me feel horrible. But like giving everyone context, you know, so that people know more information. So I'm like totally against them cutting critical race theory in school. And honestly, I don't even want to use the word anymore. I'm not comfortable with them eliminating the history. 
on both ends, period. I think I stand on the same place. I don't I don't like removing anything that um is about history at mm-hmm. all. Like I don't even care for you know, like doing Black Lives Matter, they was like taking all the, you know, racist people down and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I don't really care about any of that stuff. Yeah. Like I, I feel like leave it there as like reminders for like what this is and and if and if you gotta do all that to make somebody remove something that stands for something, then you kind of forcing them. Like mm-hmm. if they felt that should come down, then then you know like maybe a real change happened. But if you just right. made them, it's like it's still happening in that building that you can't get access to. Exactly. So it's like so don't you'll 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 get rid of that small thing and think you did something, but it's like the fight is still on. Mm-hmm. But you think you won because you took down a fucking statue that they don't give a shit about. Exactly. Because you know? that's what they really they really will take down a statue. It's I'm symbols. Like, oh. it, it, they give black people little small shit and we eat it up every time and it pisses me off. Same. It pisses me off so much. It's like it's so much going on and you think you won just because little stupid shit. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. That's why I have a joke about this, but that's why I feel like as black people, we need to keep the gays close because the way that they rally in March, they don't accept shit. They legalized gay marriage and gay people were like, not enough. Come with it. I want to go in this bathroom. Like they- no, that, that honestly needs to be studied. Yes. Cause like the way they are moving is like, they are really making shit happen. Like yeah. people are, you can't, you can't even question them. You can't really say bad things. And it's like, how is this possible? Yeah. And they're, they're getting into politics. They're, they're moving. The strategies are whoever was whoever came up with this idea is a master mastermind. They, they are masterminding. If businesses are scared of them, they are afraid of gay backlash. Businesses, I'm like during Pride Month, they got the flags up, they got the campaigns, they are moving. I'm like, listen, I'm I'll be with the gays. Like, can you tell me how you? I'll be writing notes. I'm like, okay, it's it's, it's insane. Last question I always close out with is: If you had 30 seconds to address the world, what would you say? <laughs> You know what's so funny? You sent me this question in advance, and I still couldn't think of an answer. Really? Yeah. 30 seconds to address the world. What would I say? I have another closeout question that I'm experimenting with, if you want to go with that one. Okay, let's try that one. Okay. In under a minute, name a female role model and a male role model that people should pay attention to and why. Okay, I guess that one's hard too. <laughs> Fuck it, just tell a joke. Cause my answer, that's what I'm like. Tell a joke. I'm like, God damn, this is crazy. A few, the funny thing is, the answer would be my mom and my dad, but like nobody knows them. So they I'm got like, social media. This is their chance. Put them on. No, I'm like they don't even got my. They don't be on social media. I'm like, I don't I, know. I, oh, I, I, oh, oh my gosh, I know an answer. Good, good. The first that I would say is Sydney McLaughlin. Or Sydney McLaughlin Lavroni, the Olympic runner who just broke the record again that she set in hurdles at the Olympics. I have never seen a woman so anointed in my life. It just seems like God's blessing is completely on her. She takes every single moment to center him, to elevate him, to let people know that he is the reason for her successes. She takes no moment for individual glory and turns all the attention back on him every single time that she's rewarded. It's so beautiful to see someone being loved correctly by her husband, someone being supported, someone who is humble in the midst of all of that press and media, someone who is comfortable being beautiful. She's one of the most stunning people I've ever seen. And I'm just like, I think all young girls, young men, young women should look up to her work ethic, her morals, um, the way that she carries herself, the way that she believes in herself, the way that she trains, like, I am just infatuated with her success. And I think it's something that should be studied. We're literally witnessing one of the greatest to ever do it. She keeps breaking records every time she steps on the track. She's running a sub 50 in the 400 with hurdles in front of her. Like, I mean, the hurdles are symbolic of her journey, I feel like. Like, mm. I am just like, this woman is like, okay, keep it up. I had to yeah. look her up. Okay. And you have a male role model? <laughs> This is a funny question because me not having an answer doesn't mean I hate men. <laughs> this is hard to think about. You know what I mean? Like I support men, um, but not for the reasons you think. I just don't want to end up with all sons. So I'm like, yes, I love your podcast. Let's let me watch it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, you did give us a good female one. We'll have to no, check No, okay. Let out. me think. Do we have time? I'm like, yeah, let me I can, think. I can always chop it down to make it look like, okay, okay. you know, 
Yeah, because I'll probably take out that I asked you about the thirty second thing. We'll just jump right into. Okay. Into What's it. your answer? My answer to this question. Yeah. Um, I would probably choose nineteen keys if you know who that is. He's a guy. Like my whole design behind asking this question is, I think that there's too much highlight on celebrities. Like people look uh, at LeBron for advice for uh, shit like that. Okay. So I'm like, maybe I can get people to name who they watch and who they pay attention to, and it could just spread awareness for other people to look at. Yeah. So that's the whole design behind it. But male role model would be 19 Keys. He's like my number one guy. Yeah. I don't know who that is. Yeah, you should. He is. I need to look him up. He's like, like if Malcolm X was here today, it'd be him. Yeah, I'm like, so many of my answers are just like day-to-day heroes that I feel like everyone should know and aspire to be like, but that no one would know if I said their names. But that's um, fine. If you don't, cause I'll put, I'm going to put their name up. I'm going to tag them. So they don't have to be, um, I mean, I guess it'd be, I don't know. I don't know if you want to put that kind of attention on them, but. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Definitely don't somebody know. who got like a little bit of a following or, or is actively trying to be a thought leader. There's no, there's no guy you look at and be like, damn, this guy really, really got it. He really, you know. No, I look at men and I'm just like, oh my God, if I was a man, I would be doing so much better. I got to send you some men because they, they're out here. I need to find some. I'm like, some another men. one is like my, I like look up to my boyfriend. Good. You're in a good relationship. I mean, he's just like amazing. And it's, um, it's so difficult for me to respect people. I think I treat everyone with a certain level of like human decency and respect. Everyone should be met with that on initial interaction. Mm -hmm. But to get me to really respect work ethic, how you approach the world, how you view the world, how you treat people, how you try to make the world a better place, that's tough for me. Mm -hmm. And like to me, he checks all of those boxes. So I'm like, he's great. Um, Dang, you know, these are good questions. You know what's crazy? These are the questions I wished I'm asked on a podcast. And I still don't know what I would say, a lot of podcasts are like, what's your worst dating story? Yeah, um, and I try to stay away from them. I throw them <laughs> in a little bit because I don't want people to come over here seeming like they grill, but I'm actually trying to inspire thoughts. Yeah. So it's like, we know that dating shit is like. Yes, you know. I'm like, I didn't explain. Um, well, I know my 30 seconds potentially that I would tell the world. I would tell you guys, get out and vote. I'm like, I'm not even going to try to sway you on a candidate because you need to do what's best for you. I don't like when people try to sway me. You need to do what makes sense for you, your family, the people that you surround yourself. But please just vote. It's our civic duty. It's what we're privileged to do. So many people don't have the ability to do it. So I would say get out and vote. Um, I would say don't be an asshole. The world is so hard on everyone. There's no need to be an additional person being hard on someone else. Be kind to the best of your ability. And I will also say that McDonald's is really good. And I think that more people should eat it and not hate on it. You just discredit everything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. <laughs> oh, my God. I literally will say that, like, a Big Mac or a Quarter Pounder, nobody is touching that. Nobody is touching that. That is, I think, number one, McDonald's is number one on my do not eat list. Are you dead ass? Yeah. What fast food do you eat? At this point, I haven't had it in so long. I don't like this. Does like Smoothie King and shit like that count? Oh my god, I hate someone that thinks they're better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about McDonald's. You talking about smoothies, nigga? Like, like fast is probably like Kava. That's like fast food for me. Mm. See, I wish I liked Kava because I feel like that would be a very convenient place to go. They're everywhere. It's like relatively healthy. You don't eat nothing. Like you don't have any vices. What's your vice? Food vice. Food vice is probably oh, it's a tough one. I, 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 I'm pretty. I've been on. I've been on my shit lately. I've been. I've been getting it together. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Um, I've been. Well, it was fried food. Oh, I, I, yeah, made, yeah. I made a hard stand like a month and a half ago, and I haven't broke it since. So I think it's gone. And I would like fries here and there. I love French fries. And I would get them from Five Guys usually. What? Yeah. There are so many other French fry places. That was just my one, cause I, cause a lot of other places are on my do not eat list, so I just don't even go there. But I like their fries a lot. You don't like their fries? No, like McDonald's has better fries. Also, being from LA, In and Out with the animal sauce, like. Man. I used to work at Checkers, so I would say those are the number one. Oh, fries. Checkers does have really good fries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those yeah. are number one for me if I gotta go fries. I think. Okay, yay. What do you have? What thirty seconds of advice do you have for the fans? Uh. I probably need more than 30 seconds. I get pretty deep. But I got to do 30 seconds? Yeah, I'm going to save my. When I reveal myself, I'm going to give mine so I can look into the camera. 
I can zoom in a little bit, maybe wow. add some music, a little bit of thunder or something. A little know, music. It would be some cinematic. <laughs> <laughs> but this was great. I appreciate you for coming. I Thank had a good time. Um, is there anything you wanted just to leave off with at the end? Something for people to go look at? Or you gotta oh, yeah. Or something? Um, follow me on Instagram. My Instagram is Jazzy Beats, J-A-Z-Z-Y-Y-B-E-A-T-S-S. If you go to my bio, it has the link to all of the shows I have coming up. Would love for you to come out, um, see me perform live. A lot of my best stuff I can't post on Instagram because you don't want to see people stealing my jokes. You know, what I mean? Well, let me not overestimate how funny I am because no one will probably steal my jokes. I'm still getting better, but... <laughs> I don't want anyone to know all this stuff. I want you to have to come to a show to see my best stuff. So please, please, please come. Um, also follow this podcast page if you're not following it because there's so many other amazing guests on this podcast outside of myself that you would love to watch. So that is all I got. 